the book of Colossians, reading from chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, as members of one body, you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, keep your Bibles open uh, and turn over to Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. Uh, and this is a, a great reading to recreate a scene from. So if you've got any of those materials, uh, you know, Play-Doh, Lego, cuddly toys, paper and pens, whatever it might be, uh, then this is a great one to have a go at as Pete reads for us again. We hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, written by Luke. Uh, we're reading from uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Um, the, Jesus has just been born in Bethlehem and uh, we join the shepherds in their fields as the angel Gabriel visits with them. From verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, thank you, Pete, very much for reading for us. It's no a small thing, not just doing the reading, but recording it and sending it over. So thank you uh, for all who are doing our readings at the moment. Well, it's uh, only 230 days until Christmas. Why not have shepherds and angels in our service today? Uh, how many of you, I wonder, while hearing Pete read that gospel reading, were thinking that lockdown had finally got to me and when the, the camera came back onto me, uh, I'd be wearing a Christmas jumper and singing Deck the Halls? Well, actually, Luke 2 is a really apt reading for this week. I read in an article earlier this week uh, these words. On the 8th of May 1945, the Allied powers formally accepted the unconditional surrender of the armed forces of Nazi Germany and the end of the Third Reich. The British Prime Minister Winston Churchill made a radio broadcast at 3pm announcing that the Second World War in Europe was at last at an end. All through that day, 75 years ago, there were street parties and celebrations. Uh, and at Westminster Abbey, there were Thanksgiving for Victory services uh, all through the day, on the hour, every hour from 9 a.m. to 10 in the evening. And this was the reading that they chose for those services. Luke 2, chapter uh, Sorry, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. You can see it uh, on the order of service there if you go very close to your screen. Westminster Abbey, a short service of thanksgiving for victory. And on the second page, the lesson, Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. Do not be afraid, the angels said to those shepherds cowering in fear. 
I bring you good news that will be the cause of great joy for all people. They certainly could relate, couldn't they, 75 years ago? People had been longing for that day. I was reading my, um, my grandmother-in-law's diary uh, this week. It's a great uh, diary, Collins' Naval Diary, and she's written uh, all sorts of things in it. But in the run-up to uh, VE Day, uh, it's particularly amazing. On the, the 23rd of April, Monday the 23rd of April, St George's Day, uh, end of blackout, it says, and it's double unlined. Uh, on Tuesday the 24th, the Russians in Berlin, terrible fighting. Uh, on uh, the 28th of April, Saturday, uh, Himmler, she says, asks Britain and USA for unconditional surrender, refused without Russia. And then turn over and on uh, Monday the 30th of April, uh, another message from Himmler. Is it unconditional surrender? Everyone is wondering. And then wonderfully, if you turn over to uh, May the 8th, Tuesday, it says, uh, play tennis with Gladys. Uh, I imagine uh, that tennis with Gladys would have been cancelled. There would be uh, uh, better things to do, celebrations all over the place, uh, particularly all over London. The celebrations were everywhere. I read for the first time this year that uh, Queen Elizabeth remembers her and Princess Margaret coming out onto the balcony first to, uh, to celebrate and see the celebrations, but then later on slipping out of the palace, semi in disguise, to go and celebrate among the people. There was good news that caused great joy. There was peace, at least for then. Peace that had been waited for. Peace that had been fought for. Peace that had been won. The first reading that Pete read for us talks about peace. In fact, it gives us an instruction, doesn't it? Colossians 3, chapter, uh, verse 15 to 17 tells us this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Not just try and keep the peace, not just be peaceful, but let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What is it to let something or, or someone rule you? not always a comfortable idea, is it? Well, you're saying that I am subject to you. You're saying I'm letting that person, uh, that thing, determine my actions, determine my reactions, determine what I think is right and what I think is wrong, determine my life. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. This is Paul writing to Christians in Colossae, uh, Christians who aren't always getting on. And he's saying, you need to let peace rule in your hearts. If we'd read from slightly earlier, he describes what that looks like. He says, uh, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. My guess would be that there's quite a lot of need for forgiveness at the moment, uh, with lots of people being in, in closer quarters than normal for, for a longer time, uh, with this heightened situation around us, and with uh, anger from some about how things have been handled, or, or defence from others about how else could they have been handled. Forgiveness is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because it's unnatural to us. Have you ever thought about that? Forgiveness is actually unnatural. It, it forces us to move forward in a situation when all we want to do is stay where we are, all we want to do is remind ourselves of the wrong that that person has done uh, to even uh, warrant forgiveness. And we don't want to move forward because they're in the wrong. Uh, and forgiving them would be letting them off. And that's not right because they're in the wrong. And we need to know, we need them to know, we need the world to know that they're in the wrong. Actually, we're doing uh, them and indeed the whole of society a service by not forgiving them, because they need to learn. Justice must be done. Speaking from experience a little bit there, someone once said, um, I'm always at the point of forgiveness, but I never forgive. I'm far too just for that. But of course, that's forgetting the cost of forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't just forgetting. 
there's a cost. There's always a cost of wrongdoing and forgiveness just decides who is going to pay it. The cost might be financial, but there are countless other ways that we can make someone who's wronged us carry that cost. Silent treatment, harsh words, self-righteousness, acting pained, discussing it in detail behind their back, uh, holding it over them so that uh, whenever you uh, have another argument, you've always got that thing that they did before locked and loaded and ready to use. But what's the flip side to all of that? If there's uh, always a cost of wrongdoing, what is forgiveness? Well, it's bearing that cost ourselves. Tim Keller, a pastor and theologian, uh, wrote a book on forgiveness and he said this. Now, now, hear what he says. What's the other option? He says, you can forgive. Forgiveness is refusing to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone can be agony. It's a form of suffering. You not only suffer the original loss of happiness, reputation or opportunity that the wrongdoing caused, but now you forego the consolation of inflicting the same on them. You're absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person and it hurts terribly. Paul says it in slightly fewer words, doesn't he? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So what helps? What helps us? What brings us back under that rule of the peace of Christ when we see red or, or when we're, we're blowing up because of a backhanded comment or, or whatever it might be? Well, Paul goes on, verse 16 in your Bibles. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. That word dwell is amazing, isn't it? It means live, put down roots, like settling into a new home. Let the, the message of Christ uh, dwell among you. It's a living thing. Let it take root in your hearts, in, in your family, among your friends, in this church family. How does it take root? Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, admonish one another in all wisdom. Does Paul mean that we should take turns in the vicar's study uh, streaming out to the world the sermon? Well, you're very welcome. Just drop me an email. Um, but no, Paul says we need to sing those teachings. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, he says. As a, a church, one of the ways to let peace rule in our hearts, one of the ways to let Jesus' message dwell and take root among us is to sing these truths to each other. That's why it's so uh, hard actually uh, to, to hear uh, the news from, uh, from Germany with the churches starting to go back, not being able to take communion and not being able to sing because apparently that's one uh, way that would make the, the spread of the virus worse. And we completely understand it. We need to be safe, but it's a, it's a hard thing to forego, isn't it, for a church? Because singing and music is so important in churches. Singing those words to each other breeds peace, it breeds forgiveness, it lets us teach each other. And then we take that teaching into the rest of the week, knowing that we've sung it uh, and everyone else has sung it to us and to themselves. 75 years ago, Westminster Abbey chose to celebrate peace in Europe by reminding the, the 25,000 people that came through those doors that day into the services where ultimate peace comes from. 75 years ago, two princesses came down from the balcony to celebrate peace in Europe. 2,000 years ago, the King of Glory came down from his father's side to bring peace to the world. We get to the heart 
uh, of it during the peace in our service, don't we? Christ is our peace, we say. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. Luke 2 tells us Jesus came to bring peace. That peace was won at the cross if we read on through the Gospels. That's when he made the decision to not let us pay the price for our wrongdoing, for our sin. Nailed to a cross with limited time, limited breath, he selects the important words, the words that they and we need to hear. Father, forgive them. Jesus hung on the cross, looked down at those crucifying him and said, Father, forgive. They divided up his clothes and cast lots for them. Father, forgive. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. Father, forgive. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Father, forgive. Even as that rancid sponge soaked in vinegar was hoisted up and thrust under his nose and the, the mocking challenge rang in their ears. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross, save yourself. Father, forgive. He could have chosen option one for them to pay the price for what they'd done for us to bear the cost for our sin. But he chose to bear it himself, to absorb that huge cost, the hurt, the guilt, the wrath. He took it on himself. In a few moments, we're going to sing these words together. And as we do, we're going to teach each other to remind each other of this truth. We're going to sing these words. For my life he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Justice was satisfied and peace was won. Jesus brought us back to our Father and in his strength we can let that peace that he won for us rule our hearts. We are forgiven and so we forgive.